Okay. Good afternoon everyone, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski and today we're going to look at another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at the art of David Berluk. And David Berluk uh, was one of the most unique artists in the entirety of art history. A trailblazer, an iconoclast, a a wildly eccentric human being and um, certainly like if there was a if there was any one person who might embody the definition the dictionary definition of avant-garde it would be David Berluk um, who <laughs> we're gonna I mean this painting which we're going to recreate today is um, is one of about a dozen different styles that he used throughout his career. He was not only a painter, but a poet, a promoter of himself, and the various different art groups which he founded or belonged to, as well as an illustrator and designer. I mean, this guy did all sorts of things, born and raised in Ukraine, and eventually spent the last half of his life in New York and Long Island, uh, which is, I guess, you know, part of New York State, but uh, uh, a very wild individual. So we're going to get into his biography here in a moment, but this is the painting which we are going to recreate. Lots of pointing today. <laughs> so uh, let's look at the plan for today's class. We're going to get started with getting the image onto the canvas. I'm going to show you how to do that. Then we're going to stain the canvas. While that's drying, we're going to talk a little bit about who David Berluk was. And then we're going to start the various different methods that we usually go through the paint. Now, this painting is a little bit different. And we're going to put some potentially some sand or erasers and do all sorts of funky weird stuff into this painting maybe even I'll add uh, a little bit of, of uh, thickening agents such as um, heavy matte gel that kind of stuff so we're gonna have some fun you can even probably do this painting with a palette knife as well which we haven't yet done in one of these beginner classes although we have done it previously in other episodes so anyway I would say in about two hours we should be looking at our at finishing up wrapping up the class so just as a reminder, if uh, you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell because I'm often doing episodes that uh, haven't been announced or are quite spontaneous. I almost did one at like midnight last night and I still might do that episodes in the future. So as well, if you want to support the channel, here's a couple of links to do that. So let's get the image onto the canvas. So I've already... You know, I've, I've done an outline of this image, which you can download and print. This is what it looks like. You can download this and print it. I'm going to show you where to get that. So there's a Dropbox folder. I think it's one of the very first links in the description below. You'll see all of our beginner, very, very simple uh, painting, you know, intro to painting classes and the, the, the uh, materials that go along with that are right here, as well these are our, our most simple paintings and you'll see today's painting is included right here so but before i just show you that i want to show you there's another 150 folders down here these are all paintings that we've already done you know a whole week on van gogh um the jasper johns american flag we did there's a mona lisa in here somewhere we've done a lot of picasso diego rivera Artists from all over the world, every culture, all of the, the main, big, large cultures, and we're going to continue that as we go through here. There's lots of other artists that I want to get to, uh, including from Japan and China here. Uh, anyway, so, you know, our most recent episodes are going to be towards the, the end here, the last uh, couple dozen, if you're looking for more advanced classes. I should just also let you know that here's the private Facebook group. I encourage you to join that and take a photograph of today's painting, upload it to the Facebook group. 
I just want to show you <laughs> some, one of the fun, awesome things here. Here's one of our students, Alex. This is a drawing he did of me, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny and very flattering. I love this. Thank you so much, Alex. It means a lot to me that, to, that you made my uh, portrait of me. I appreciate that. So anyway, if we go all the way back up here, David Burlick, uh, you'll see that there's actually a number of files in here. There's six files. And inside there, you're gonna see the outline for today's painting. This is the original. You can see there's a lot of texture in here. And then you're also gonna see that there's another painting also by him in here. And this, there's the outline for that as well. So if you wanna try doing something a little bit different, this is part of his Cubo Futurist period, which we'll talk about here as part of his biography. But I mean, these two paintings look very different. At least on the surface, we can all we'll talk about how there's some kind of cubist or futurist elements of this painting as well. But anyway, so once you've downloaded the outline, we're going to transfer it onto the canvas. And I just realized I need to I thought I'd open that up. Um, let's see. I'm gonna play this video once it opens the beach ball well that was the painting we did just on last week now that one that one turned out really great oops let me just mute that okay where are we Let's play it from here. And so I'll just talk over top of this. So what I've done is I've printed out the outline onto just a regular eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And then I'm gonna put it on top of this nine by 12 sized canvas, canvas board, which I've also sanded and, and put some gesso on, on it. Although for today's painting, because we're gonna put so much texture on it, you, you could skip that entire step entirely. I mean, most people don't do it at all. Now I'm using some carbon transfer paper and you can see I've used it many times. I think this might be the last time I use it and make sure the shiny side is down so that it's you're not gonna just transfer the image onto the back of the photocopy. You can get two-sided uh, uh, carbon paper as well. And then you see, I'm just gonna use this ballpoint pen. You could use a pencil, and which is what I used for a long time. So let's just skip forward here because it's pretty, pretty obvious. I think I did most of the lines here. You see, I used a ruler just for a few. That uh, uh, and I think I'm almost done. Let's let this play out because um, I, th I don't. You know, there's some other ones of these outlines that have a lot of detail on them. And sometimes I just don't do all the details because it's kind of um, not entirely necessary. Come on, let's finish that off, Michael. Yeah, looks good. Oh, I think I missed a little bit on the eye. I think I just want to make sure that that's going to be there. That seems probably good enough <laughs> let's do it dude sometimes I just want to make sure before I peel that tape off that I do indeed have everything on there that I want because once you peel that tape off it's trying to get it back into the same place it's just not gonna happen okay wow lots of comments in the chat already you guys are pretty yeah, Pascal says there's almost no carbon left on that carbon paper. Um, okay, so now that we've got our outline on here, I can take this and I can recycle it or I can, sometimes I even, in fact, since I might get this pretty thick with uh, material here, maybe I'll, uh, uh, I'm gonna keep, I often keep this just outside of view so that when I'm painting, if things get too busy, I can refer to that as well. Let's turn the baby uh, monitor off there. I always sometimes forget. So if you're like, wow, it sounds like he's in a windstorm. Hmm. Oh, 
good question, Pascal. So Pascal says, how do you complete the edges if the lines don't reach the full nine by 12? So even here, you know, you can see a little bit of the tree got clipped off. Um, I'm just gonna enlarge that. And I will also just draw any additional lines here. In fact, let's just look at the original. Let's put them side by side and just see if maybe there's I think we could probably continue this line out. I mean, sometimes we can just sort of have fun and add all sorts of weird things on the edge. You could add a border. Like, let's, I'm just gonna turn that into a small thing there. Let's think that could probably go off. Okay, sometimes I like to break up these shapes. If there's a big space like that, I might just divide that again, just so that we have some smaller spaces, including maybe up here. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. So now that we've got that established, let's start putting some paint onto the canvas. And actually, let's... Do this here. So the next step, once we've got our drawing onto the canvas, is we want to start putting some color onto the canvas. And we could just start this right away, painting directly onto the white uh, canvas that just has a few lines. But many artists throughout history, especially up until maybe the last 60 years, use this process called the imprematura. And the imprematura in Italian just means the first coat of paint. And I strongly believe in doing this process. You could certainly just skip ahead another 10 minutes or, or less from, from this point. But um, I really firmly believe that this is a great way just to get the painting started, get, get a little bit of color on the canvas, so that if we have little gaps in between the ultimate, the finished area of paint, it's gonna look like there's color there and not just bare canvas that we didn't cover. Because sometimes that just, to me, that looks like a little bit of an oversight. So I'm gonna squeeze some of this paint out. And the color that I use, I just use some warm yellow. And you're thinking, warm yellow, what does that mean? These are the colors that I do all of the paint, all 212 paintings. And we've done, in some episodes, as you know, maybe two or three paintings. So there's probably about 300 of these paintings we've done. So um, this is the color. So when I'm talking about, I'm using my warm yellow. This is my Aza Yellow Deep, right? I'm using a cool yellow. That's what I'm talking about. And so on and so forth, right? Now you don't need to buy this brand of paint. I'm not sponsored by anybody, I'm not paid, but the, I do think that Amsterdam paint is probably your best bang for your buck in terms of the amount of paint you get for, like this is maybe a 10, 12 tube of paint, dollar tube of paint versus, you know, as I mentioned before, something like this by Golden is probably like $25, right? And it's half the size or less, right? So. Um, golden is, is a much better, more uh, professional grade of paint. Uh, you can use that, you can use Liquitex. This is their cheaper student grade, but you, they, Liquitex has a higher quality brand. Here's uh, Windsor and Newton. They're, per, they're most famous for their oil paints, but here's their acrylic line. Artist Loft, that's by Michael's Art Supplies. Buzz, um, Peebo. Holbein, 
Dialer Rowney. Again, all of this is in the very first few episodes of the um, Master Study series. One, two, three, four, five, I think, episodes. So now I'm going to take... I've put a little bit of my warm yellow. I'm going to put a little bit of water in here. Just a few little splashes, and then I'm going to mix it up. This is going to just thin the paint out a little bit, make it easier to spread across the canvas. And it also was going to dry just a little bit faster. Because and essentially what we're doing is just staining the canvas. Just think of it as, as staining the canvas, as opposed to really painting the canvas. It, artists um, often will paint the underpainting or paint lines as part of the imprimatura process. And, you know, you, if there's... All, every art term, every art process is contested by someone, by some artists throughout history. There's been someone who says, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do, do it this way. So if you've seen somebody do a different version of an imprimatur, it doesn't mean that they're right and I'm wrong or that I'm right and they're wrong. It's just that different people have different approaches to doing things. And I certainly encourage you to to do your own research, whether it's about art or anything else in life, and, and explore and just see what methods work best for you and what you prefer doing, what results you get that, you know. So, we've done imprimaturas with, with cool red and cool blue and warm red and, uh, I, mean, I don't know if we've done a warm blue in premature before but there's no reason why you couldn't uh, I mean the the main difference is you're gonna ultimate it's gonna affect all of the colors over top of it ever so slightly and this is also a process that's used primarily by portrait painters and landscape painters and usually they would use a little bit more of a rusty red color. I think I'm probably the only one who promotes this warm yellow process. Um, just because I use the warm yellow because it's fast and we don't have to mix any paints to get the painting started. We can just go right off and start with this warm yellow and it gives everything this kind of nice Kodachrome glow at by the end, right? Okay. <laughs> ah. Donna says, I think I'm going to do this one to go with my ladies picking apples that I'm almost done. Yes. Yes. Th those were... I have my... All of the ones that we've done focusing on Ukrainian artists, which I think this is, what, our fourth or fifth uh, one, have turned out really, really good. I'm really excited with the way they've turned out, which is sort of aligns with, you know, my my ancestry is Ukrainian, so the fact that these paintings focusing on Ukrainian artists are turning out well is makes... There's some, just like here, Berlick's his painting, is this is about his Cossack... Uh, ancestor, I think, is the paint the na title of the painting. So, somewhere back deep, deep, deep in my ancestry, there's also a Cossack um, uh, ancestor who's smiling right now. Okay, so let's um, let's look at. Oops, where are we? Let's look at the biography of David Berluk and um, a little bit about why I chose him and why he's, he's I think, still so influential, such an influential uh, artist, as well as one of the titans of Ukrainian art. Um, okay. So here's, uh, we'll just look at the Wikipedia page. And we can already see just... <laughs> right off the bat this is 
almost every photo that you see of David Burlook, he's got something painted on his face. And that should already tell you a little bit about who this guy is. This is 1914, and it was not uncommon for him to put to draw on his face and to put strange makeup on his face to dress up in strange costumes and you know if someone was to walk around I mean it kind of reminds me of you know hip-hop artists rappers today getting f tattoos on their face now this isn't a tattoo he, he painted different things on his face all the time but right off the bat we're, we're talking about a, a, a very eccentric individual here. Uh, so born in 1882 and dies in 1967 in the United States. Actually, I wanted just to show you. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about where he's from. I was hoping to get this queued up. I forgot to get the map. So where he's from, this little village in eastern Ukraine here, kind of near Kharkiv here, which is, and Sumy, which if you know, you've been following anything about the um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Come on, what's going on here? So this is the Ukrainian border here. Here's Russia and a lot of the the, the, the major fighting that's been going on in Ukraine over the past month and a half has been, you know, Crimea, which was annexed by Russia in 2014 and is still considered by the vast majority of, of earthlings to be part of Ukraine. Um, but here's like the, the Donbass and Luhansk regions here and as well. In Kharkiv has been some of the, the bloodiest combat so it is just worth just acknowledging that, that the artist we're talking about today is from the very area that has seen some of the, the worst of uh, worst violence um, as part of this unprovoked illegal war um, okay what should we talk you know another thing too both of his brothers were also artists. Uh, his brother Vladimir and Nikolai, who um, were also members of some of the groups that Berluk uh, founded or was a part of. So they there was a, obviously a, a deep friendship that the brothers had, uh, brotherhood that um, carried throughout their lives. Although, as we'll talk about shortly, unfortunately, Vladimir died in World War I. Um, so what's interesting is, you know, from a, from an early age, he's studying all over, he's traveling and studying all over the place. So, you know, at age, what is he, um, but like 16, he's, he starts studying in Kazan, which is, uh, you know, about a 200 kilometers east of Moscow. And then he studies art in Odessa, which is in the exact opposite direction from where he lived. Odessa is in the southwest of Ukraine on the Black Sea. And then he goes to Munich to go to in, in Austria to go to, to study there and um, or sorry, in Germany. And um, and while he's in in Munich, one of his instructors compares him to a wild horse, a wonderful wild horse. Because already by the age he would have been in his very like twenty one, he's already one of the the. He's a he's an extrovert and an eccentric person, you know. He's the kind of person you know. I, I teach at an art school here in Vancouver, and a lot of younger kids when they come to school, you know, have purple hair and are dressed in you know in clothes that they've made themselves they're usually some of the the outcasts of the high schools they've gone to and it, this Berluk seems to me sort of like the prototypical art student right just you know a very colorful person again you know dressing up and painting his face 
and we'll see here he never really abandons that approach to to life in general um from and also another thing that 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 he's sort of really well known for is the collaborative spirit that that pervades throughout his art practice so he's constantly befriending all of these artists many of whom become some of the most famous artists of the era particularly from eastern europe uh, from Russia and Belarus and Latvia, Poland, uh, and then when he eventually goes uh, out west and into Europe, he's he's befriending other European artists, and then when he goes to the United States, befriends them. But he's also and he's founding different art movements, and and usually that's like um, the the. Uh, the appeal of that is working in conjunction alongside other artists and you know playing ideas off one another and there's this he's a he's also a poet and a writer so he's writing manifestos all the time you know he's just this energy machine cranking stuff out constantly uh we'll take a look at his work here in a moment um Uh, so in 1909, he meets his, his wife, Maria, um, and she features in a lot of his work, which we'll see here shortly. Basically, the, the major themes of his work are Ukraine and his wife, right? And so even long after he leaves Ukraine, he's still kind of, he always has this, um, it's very dear to him. He's after he moves to the United States, he's not allowed back to what is, becomes the Soviet Union until the last, I think, decade or so of his life. He's allowed to short little visits, which um, must have been pretty difficult for someone like that, whose art is all about where he came from. Um, what do I want to say here? We'll talk about futurism here in a moment. Um, okay, so how about one of the things that, that he's known for is is founding Russian futurism. Now, he's Ukrainian, but you have to remember um, Ukraine is has for a long time been, you know, a subject been occupied by Russian forces for centuries. Uh, so there's always this Ukrainian identity of which Berluk is famous, is, you know, interested in, in sort of fostering nationalist sentiments and, and, and uh, identity, and uh, which is one of the reasons why for quite, for that extended period, he's not allowed back into the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union the last thing they want is to foster you know the the independent spirit of Ukrainians but anyway he's one of the ones that is known for founding Russian futurism now I think I do I have futurism generally is seen as having is being an Italian art movement that's that sort of spreads out elsewhere essentially futurism occurs simultaneously in Russia and Italy um, and the name futurism is kind of adopted by Russian artists in fact kind of this, along the same period of time there's this group that he founds Haleya I think is I'm not sure how you pronounce it uh, Hi, yeah Haleya I guess and I looked this up I can't quite figure out what the origin of, or if it's just a nonsense word. It seems to have like a Greek origin and like a, a Greek, like a little songbird from Greece. But it wouldn't surprise me if they chose the word at random by opening up a dictionary and just putting their finger in it, which sounds ridiculous. But that's a big part of, of the work that they were doing because later on, one of the things that they, that the futurists, like they're, <laughs> the the manifesto that Berluk co-writes or probably authored the vast majority of it is called a slap in the face of public taste that's the that's the the founding document of Russian futurism just a, a slap in the face of public taste right <laughs> which just goes right to show you what they're what they're all about is they're about confronting all of the the norms of society 
all of the you know the um, bourgeois values, especially when it comes to aesthetics, you know, like what I what beauty actually is, and um, what what the futurists are doing is not just painting, right? So Italian futurism is both painting and writing, but I think today when we think of Italian futurism, we probably think mostly about the painting, even though it was founded by a writer, um, Marinetti, the, 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 it, it at the time was probably considered to be more of a writing, a literature, um, movement than it was a painting movement. Things have sort of changed as history has sort of, um, uh, categorized and packaged it but Russian futurism was probably if anything more of a of a literature poetry movement than it was a painting movement and um, the the essential thing between both forms of futurism and if you want you can read um, uh, this JSTOR is the is the sort of the repository of like academic documents and you can download I think the link is in the description below. The the actual original futurist manifestos, a, a slap in the face of public taste <laughs> by the Russian futurist, if you want. Um, this is just the introduction here, but uh, all of these links are in the description below. But um, essentially what the futurists are all about is, is making a break from the past. And, and we have... The futurists are generally obsessed with technology, and they see cars replacing horse-drawn carriages. They see trains taking people across all of Europe in a matter of days, as opposed to what it, months it used to take people. There's telegraph lines being laid between, you know, New York and London. You know, radio is in movies are being created. It's just like there's all of this new stuff going on, and so those artists of that period sort of look back at the dusty old paintings in the museums, and they're like, "What is this stuff? This has nothing to do with our contemporary world today." And Marinetti, the Italian futurist, is famous for saying we should burn down the art museums and in Italy that would mean destroying the Michelangelo's the Leonardo's all of the, the you know the great Renaissance paintings and which I mean I, I, we're probably pretty glad that that didn't happen although both especially the Italian movement uh, had quite a lot of political influence so you know it's not it's not it wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibility had that actually happened um but anyway they uh you know one of the 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 main <laughs> we have here alexander rodinchenko who's a very famous russian sculptor um he himself talks about how when he saw one of these performances that the the russian poets put on it was so shocking because a fight broke out. The audience was furious. You know, it's just the kind of thing that we don't really think of happening these days. But people were upset. Like, sometimes, like, there were very provocative performances, usually using made-up words. And so you can imagine sitting down for a play for, like, 10 minutes. You're like, this is crazy. I want my money back. You go to the front door to ask for your money back, and they're like, nope, sorry. And then, in fact, not only that, they push you and try to push you back into your seat. You're like, what? I want to leave. And like, no, fight's breaking out. And the performers are still performing on the stage. And they're dressed up. Their, their faces are all painted, just like Berluku had earlier, but even wilder. It's just chaos, right? And again, part of that is, is the deliberate attempt by the futurists to, to like reflect what is going on in the world at that moment of like the chaos of modernity and so it's very exciting but also wildly unpredictable almost a dangerous type of atmosphere and that is really all the brainchild of david berluk 
So, um, what else do I want? Oh, you know, I want to show you a bunch of his work here before we move on. So I'm, I'll just kind of go through this kind of quickly. Um, but you could see like some of his early work. So at this this stage, he's like in his early twenties, right? So he has a fairly um, straightforward education, academic uh, art education. So he would have learned how to paint uh, from the human body and learned how to use glazing, various different glazing techniques, etc. Um, but very quickly here, you know, he starts really playing with with cubism, which is sort of in its infancy here, um, and of course gets um, interested in futurism, or or what you know, futurism only survives, in, especially in Russia, for about five years until World War One takes off, and uh, effectively sort of um, a lot of Russian. Uh, artists and Ukrainian artists, Belarusian artists, Polish artists get sucked into uh, the war. In fact, uh, Vladimir Berluk, uh, David Berluk's brother, is conscripted into the Russian army and goes to Greece, I think, and is is killed in World War One. You know, near the outset of or 1917, I think. Um, so immediately David Berluk is like, oh no, I do not want to get sent to the front lines. I am not going to die for, for this madness. So over the next four years, Berluk, he actually goes east rather than west into like France and, and, and to escape Russia. He actually goes to Siberia. He, he goes then to Japan, takes a, um, a, a steamship to Canada and eventually works his way all the way across the United States to New York City, which is where he spends the next 40 years of his life. But it took him four years on that journey across Russia, through Siberia, to Japan, Canada, United States, to finally settle in New York. And so quite the journey that he embarked upon there. And so, well, let me see. So we could see, here's some of the paintings that begin in this um, uh, kind of cubo-futurist phase that he's in. This is another painting that I was thinking about doing today. You can see he did a few versions of this. Um, uh, his Cossack ancestor here. Um, he explored printmaking, obviously, as well. He's got some pointillist stuff going on here. You know, some of this looks like a Chagall kind of painting, or um, a little bit like Boychuk, right? We talked about Boy the apple tree painting that Donna was working on. You know, has this sort of Byzantine painting approach here. Um, this is another quite well-known painting by Berluk as well. So you can just see, like, they're very different approaches, right? Here's a painting that is fairly straightforward. Here's another one that looks a little bit more like a cubist painting. Here's these paintings with a lot of texture, like we're about to do. And then he goes to one that's maybe a lot more like a fauvist, bright colors. Here's a futurist painting. And these are all happening simultaneously. Here's another fauvist approach. Here's a cubist type painting, right? Here's that other one that's in the Dropbox folder. I mean, the guy is just zipping back and forth between all sorts of different approaches to painting. So at this point, in 1922 is when he arrives in New York, and one of the things he tries to do when he's in New York is to kind of establish his reputation as kind of the founder of Russian futurism. Um, it, he sort of uses that as his calling card and really tries to... He, you know, like a, like a lot of Soviet artists is both, you know, against, you know, uh, the the oppression that, that, that one saw in Soviet uh, Ukraine and Russia, and then also kind of nostalgic for a home that he's no longer able to go, f go to, and I'm sure there was just a very conflicted time in his, in uh, that last, like, these are beautiful. These drawings here, oh my goodness. 
And so, even though he's living in, in New York, we see a couple of, you know, um, paintings of, of kind of New York. There's Washington. But a lot of them are his memories of, of life. This is another painting that I, I was thinking about doing. If I want to do a whole week on Burlook, this would be probably one of them here. I love all these, you know, colored pencil portraits he's doing. And, and probably a little bit of, of his his desire to do some of these kind of uh, more, I guess you could say, realistic portraits is probably to kind of, to, as like a, as like a, what would you call that? Um, as like a fortification against calls, you know, that when he's making his, his wilder type of art, you know, even like this looks like a lot like Chagall. Um, that he's like, yeah, you know, I can make those paintings, but I can also make ones that have a more of a classical approach. You know, these types of paintings. This looks like Tchaikovsky, like surrealist kind of influences happening here. I mean, these are just. I mean, these a floating head amongst a landscape. <laughs> These ones look almost like caricatures of, uh, you know, like political cartoons. Um, anyway, just a lot of flowers, and a lot of flowers that, that are um, indigenous to Ukraine and Crimea, which is Crimea is is sort of the the ancestral homeland for the Cossack. Um, who are the, you know, when, when a lot of people think of Ukraine and Ukrainians, they're probably thinking of Cossacks, who are the sort of nomadic people that um, rode on horses throughout the countryside, and uh, they're, they're the kind of the spiritual soul of Ukraine, even though there's plenty of Ukrainians that, that don't have Cossack ancestry. A lot of Ukrainians have Russian ancestry or Polish ancestry or Viking ancestry. Uh, Ukraine has been in this contested place for about a thousand years. Lots of different people have invaded it. And um, Anyway, so I mean, just we can keep on going. Again, you can see these, these paintings here of like these you know, Ukrainian women with shawls carrying food, and you know the sunflower, all all those kind of typical Ukrainian um, imagery. Anyway, so let's move on here. There's already I can already think of a few things that I, that I want to talk about as we progress through this painting. But um, what should we do first here? Now. When we talk about underpainting, as I've said a number of times, underpainting can have various different approaches. Some people do an underpainting with just lines. I mean, typically, what an artist might do is apply an imprimatur, get it started, and might have a whole bunch of these just stacked up, ready to go, with a stain, that, like a little bit more of a rusty red, probably, and then take those and then do the underpainting directly on top of that. I, or do a, an underdrawing on top of that as well and I I'm not sure how he would have how he his sort of method but um, I think I might just go directly into the painting without doing an underpainting so the first step okay so if I'm just going to skip over the underpainting stage and go directly to painting, then I'll probably start in my background and start establishing a little bit of the background in here. Okay, so I just remembered I wanted to mix some sand into my paint, so I think I'm going to run and grab my sand really quickly. Uh, one second, I'll be back in 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Oh, okay. 
So here's some sand from uh, our daughter's sandbox outside because I want to try mixing a little bit of this into the paint to help get more and more texture. So maybe before we do that, let's uh, put some paint on the palette. Open some new tubes here soon. Now, if we're gonna use, uh, if we're gonna try to simulate a lot of texture in in a painting like this, it might mean we end up using a lot of paint, which can be kind of expensive. Um, so there's different ways that that you, that you can sort of make paint thicker without actually using a lot of paint. Uh, I mean, you still kind of gotta bite the bullet and, and use maybe more paint than you might normally uh, think of using. Let's see. But we can kind of get away with a little bit less by mixing things in like sand or pencil shavings, etc. What I do here, I love this contraption. You can see the difference, it kind of squeezes this paint out. I, I think something like this costs maybe 20 bucks at the art supply store. This allows me just to get right in here. I got a little tiny like this. Okay. So we'll see. Maybe if, if I need more, I got still got a bit left in there too. Hmm. Pascal says, what's the name of this thing? Uh, let me see, I'll put it down here. It's, it's called the Tube Ringer. Um, but I'll show you, I have another one here somewhere. It's cheaper. So here's another version of this that you can use but obviously it doesn't fit in every tube right it's more convenient for something does it even fit on this one oh, <laughs> you need the smaller tubes um, but essentially you know you could just use if you didn't have this type of thing you could use let's say like a pencil and often what I do is just sort of wrap these around And then you just keep on curling it and curling it. Um, you can do that. Or again, just take something like this and kind of try to scrape that paint forward. And then once you've got as much of that paint out, then you can use a little spatula to scoop that paint out. Because that makes me feel so good to throw out this as opposed to a tube you know this this tube right here has got very little paint left in it but you could see there's this is paint on the inside of the tube so i am i'm i'm cheap but i'm also there's i think i'm i'm loath to like throw paint out because it always just seems to me like that's just wasted potential it's painting that just wasn't that was 
unmade or something. So, uh, yeah, like a toothpaste tube, yes. And Heidi says you can get probably one of the, wherever I put it, <laughs> wherever I put that thing, um, that little key, you can get that at the dollar store for a couple of bucks. Okay. So, now we're going to start painting this. Hmm. Huh. I would... I think I'm going to start with my cool blue, and then as the sky, and then start working my way forward. So that's, that seems logical. Okay. So... Does this canvas dry? I think it's dry. So, to get started here, I think I'm going to need more cool blue. So, um, because I, I'm going to use some sand and things in here. And... I mean, this is going to be kind of one of the messier paintings, I'm assuming. That's, that's good for right now. Let's take some white. And some of this blue. Put this side by side here. I'll also, we can use heavy matte gel. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit of Should I do, I was just thinking maybe should I do a little bit without it and just use sand? The other thing, if you don't have sand or heavy matte gel, you could take an eraser. Hmm. Not sure where my other erasers went, but you could take any eraser and just erase, you know, like a... Uh, on, a, on the table, and all of the little residue, you know, all those little shavings from an eraser. We did that a few weeks ago with, with the Nicole Eisenman painting, the sad sailor or the crying sailor. Anyway, let's just start going here. I'm going to take this, mix this paint up. I'm also not going to worry about making it, mixing it in too much, because I think part of his process is seeing the, the, um, yeah, let's let me save this for a little bit here. A part of his process involves, um, you know, paint mixing on the canvas. That's quite a lot of sand I just put in here, and I feel like I'm going to be getting sand all over my studio. Uh, I should instead of using my fingertips. Let's see. I'll just. It is worth mentioning, if you're going to use sand, um, you may want to just be careful uh, at the end of the, your painting session, but when you're dumping water down the sink, is to probably try to strain it out so that you don't dump a bunch of sand into your sink. That sand is probably going to stay in the, the pipes. So what I would do is get as much water out of a cup like this or, you know, as possible, and then throw it outside into like an alleyway so that the sand stays outside. Look at all this mess I'm creating. This today's gonna be a messy painting. <laughs> oh, that is cool. You gotta check that out. That is a look at that texture. That is cool. I'm digging that. Ooh. Even better than the than the eraser shavings. Okay. So I'm gonna take some more of this white and just put that in here and allow it to be my brush to be kind of goopy like this. Let's I'm gonna start right up here. Okay. So I haven't added any extra medium in here. 
which is going to mean that as this paint dries, it's going to get it'll, it'll lose some of the thickness that it currently has. Which I don't mind, but it's just something to keep in mind. If we want to, to keep more of the texture that I see right here, I want to add a little bit of uh, matte uh, medium or gloss um, gel uh, into painting here. So, you know what, I'm just going to paint around here. Now, you're, if you're looking at the painting, you're like, hmm, it looks like it's a little bit of a deeper blue, Michael. I totally agree. I think he's got a little bit, probably mostly warm blue um, in this painting in the background. zoom back out here. Hmm. I'm going to do this up here. I'm, I'm going to probably differ quite a lot from his painting throughout today's episode. Just because it's using this type of approach with these um, with all of the sand and stuff in here is going to make it kind of difficult to get into the little details. So you can see me spin the brush like that to try to get that paint off so they're not just painting at the tip of the brush but getting as much of the thicker paint to get try to get that off okay is that I think that's a good start so how about let's just take a little bit more. I'm just going to take scoop some of that white off. And I think I need a little bit of the blue. I'm going to scoop, mix some blue in here. Allowing this to get dirty. Let's take another pinch of sand. So, you know, I've kind of obliterated a little bit of this, but I can, as paint starts to dry, I can add a little bit of that back and I can kind of complicate this a little bit. Just, again, this is sort of our first pass on the background too. Okay. Um, maybe since I've got all this blue on my brush, 
what I'm gonna do is, I think I'm just gonna take this, let's, let's actually just get a bit of that cold blue off. Rather than wiping it on, on here, because that's just gonna go all over my floor, all that sand, I'm just gonna actually wash my brush in my water here. Just get all that sand off. And I'm going to take another pinch. Maybe let's take even more of this sand. And I'm going to mix that sand <laughs> into this blue. I really like this. That is cool. It remains to be seen how it all dries, but I mean, I've seen artists use sand all the time. It's not a particularly innovative technique that I'm using here. Um, but let's go back into here. I think I'm gonna... I guess this could be darker than this warm blue. But I'm just gonna keep it like that. It's also kind of, I don't know if you can hear the gritty painting with this. is just so different. I've never painted with sand in my paint before, so it's, it's fun to, to explore something totally different. Should I do? Let's. I'll make a little bit of a darker blue there. out of my warm blue and sand. Uh, okay. That is cool. It remains to be seen how well this is going to work if we use um, with smaller brushes. How about let's do our tree and then some green. Should we do the green after? Let's do the... Although it looks like he did the green first. It's hard to tell. You know what? I'm going to do my green first because then I can always take green, add a bit of red to it, and then I've got brown. So let's mix this green, which appears to be... A, a kind of a cooler green. I'm going to take my cool blue and cool yellow and mix these up and I got a pretty electric green. And he adds a little bit of white into it. So let's do that as well. some of this white. So by adding white to any color, you reduce the intensity of that color. It gets a little bit pastel, right? We always think of it as lightening the color, but it also takes away the, the, the brightness, the intensity of the color. 
which um, can be a good thing. It can also uh, it can be a little bit frustrating if you're like, oh, how come that color is not so vibrant anymore? That's one of the main things that white does. Or really, if you add the opposing color on the opposite side of the color wheel, you're also going to lower the intensity. So here's my green. So I'm going to put this up here. One of the things we can, so we can build up all of this texture and then as we come back after it starts to dry a little bit, we can paint over some of it and get a little, get back into the details. Like in this area, it's not all green underneath the, the feet of that uh, horse, but we can um, add another color over top of it later. I think that's do I have all is that all the green I need I think so maybe let's put a bit up here okay so now to, to if we want to turn this into a brown let's take some of our cool red and we'll just mix it off to the side before we go too far right take some of that now it's gonna go a little bit gray I think we just need to put way more red in here. going very blah. So I'm going to take a bit of warm red. See if I can bring that brown back out a bit more. This doesn't go too gray. That's okay for right now. We can always darken this. Or should we darken it now? You know what? Maybe I will darken it a bit now. I'm just going to actually mix this color separately over here. So that's maybe the closer to the color I want. Not not too dissimilar. Um
horse. Put this color here. Obviously, we're gonna alter it later on. In fact, I'm just let's just paint that right over. Right, so you could see me kind of at the top of the screen there just scooping big parts of this paint out. Have a bunch of kind of darker areas. In fact, I'm just just paint this right here. Cover that up. Cover that up. Once I get a bunch of this texture applied, then I can paint over top of it, and it'll be like that textures in that paint. It'll be a little bit easier to work with. Because at the moment, this is a bit of a, <laughs> it's not the, it's a bit of a, a tricky material to, to paint with all that sand in there. Let's just paint that there. Cool. That would be a darker area. Okay. You guys are hilarious. In the chat there. That was a long <laughs> lolly. Okay. So what should we do next? I think um You know what? I might just bring this sky back. I'm just gonna bring it down over here. I suppose one could have added sand into the Imprematura. The one thing I would suggest if you're thinking about doing that to just get the whole canvas with some texture is instead of using water in your Imprematura, you'd, you'd want to use matte medium. Because if you use water and, and acrylic, then the water is going to break down 
essentially the glue, the binder of that paint. And if you mix sand into it, you're, you're probably, what would likely happen is as soon as it dried, all that sand would just come right off. Whereas because I'm mixing that paint or the sand into the paint, I'm using the glue properties of paint to help stick this sand to the paint and to the canvas, right? So you're, you're certainly, that, that would work. The one thing I, I do like, you know, that, that we could do that much faster. That would have been a, a really fast way to get this painting started. But I also like painting in this way. It's very gritty and I, I'm, maybe I wouldn't quite have that same experience that I'm having right now. Uh, let's see, where should we go to next? Maybe let's do a cool yellow with Imprimatur, or sorry, with sand. <laughs> oh, maybe more yellow than I was thinking. That's the thing, is sometimes you can't squeeze any paint out of a tube and you think, oh, it's just garbage. And then you squeeze it and then like, look how much paint comes shooting out. So, um, be careful here. Let me see. In fact, so, I think I am going to add just a little bit of heavy gel into this paint just so you can kind of see. Uh, heavy gel is going to help preserve more of the texture of the paint beyond because we, yes we're gonna put sand in it but what's gonna happen is most of this is gonna go flat except little areas where the sand is accumulated the heavy matte gel which I just put in here and I'll show you that I'll mix it in a second is gonna help keep more of the body of that paint preserved in here and Yeah, okay, so let's let's take so this is right there. That's not white paint, that's my heavy matte gel. So I'm gonna mix that in. And at the moment it just sort of looks the same. It just maybe looks a little bit thicker. But what's gonna happen is when if I just let that dry on my, my palette now, it's gonna look pretty much like that. Um and then let's put a bit of sand in there as well just to give it that a little bit more of a gritty texture and then I just dip my fingers into my water to help get the rest of that sand off let's mix that up oh I didn't even occur to me <laughs> that that sand was going to change that color a little bit that's interesting you can't really see it when it's in the blue, but when we put it into the yellow, it's very apparent. Hmm. Interesting. It kind of has turned that paint a bit green. That is quite wild. I would not have expected that. Uh, I'm going to paint a little bit with it anyway, because in the painting, especially kind of right on his guitar, or I guess this would be a mandolin, perhaps. That right in the middle. These are his sleeves of his shirt, and I think I'm going to have to go down to a smaller brush to start getting into
You can see why having this yellow can be helpful, especially if we're painting like this and we have little gaps between the, the colors. That's gonna play a bigger, bigger, more and more important role as we go forward. Because without it, then we would start having a lot of white showing through. And personally, I would find that just really frustrating. I'm going to take my white now and mix some white into this paint because he's got white or kind of a, a little bit lighter almost kind of gray off on the side so maybe we'll, we'll wait till we get there I'm just doing the right side of that canvas here. Do. I'm going to take a little bit. So this is my cool blue, warm red. Let's take some of this yellow in here. Take some of this blue. This will go gray. So, so just so you can know what I'm, I just did here. I, this was, remember just a few moments ago, I, I took some warm red, cool blue, and mix that together. I got this kind of uh, dark uh, brownish color. And now I, all I did is I took some cool yellow that I have here, mix it in there. It wasn't going quite as dark as I wanted. So I just took some of this cool blue that I made earlier, which had white in it. And this is, just goes gray, right? And I'm gonna paint a little bit with that. I guess I want it to be more gray. Hmm. I think I'll paint with this. just realizing that he painted I mean this is yellow and then he painted this uh, over top of it um, by these by the boots and stuff and such 
So I'll, maybe I'll, after this dries a bit, I'll put yellow back as a bit of an outline. Or I could even, well, it'll be harder to glaze with it. But, uh, Okay, so just zoom out just so you can see how this is all unfolding. Um, I think that's okay. I think what I want to do now is just get a little bit of a kind of a purple thing going here. Let's take our that color here. I just took a little bit of warm red. Six, oh, I should have done this with my cool red. Hmm. I think I can get away with this here. Let's be a bit more of a muted purple anyway. So again, I'm not really too concerned about getting the colors all right at this stage. I'm generally, I'm not ever really, but um, I'm laying kind of the big blocks of color in, which can always be manipulated and changed at a future time. do this um, kind of money bag over here. Let's just take some white. A little bit of sand. I wonder how that white and sand are going to behave.
pretty good. So it's not surprising that the white is able to absorb the color of the sand better because white is, is especially titanium white, is great at concealing. I know this is not a money bag. It looks like a money bag from a cartoon, but uh, I think this is... All of these elements in this painting are are kind of significant little details that sort of tell us a little bit about the story of uh, a Cossack. And to be honest, I don't know the meaning of many of them. And some of them might be traditional elements. And then some of them could just be things that are very specific to Berlick. So, okay, trying to get. I'm going to be painting orange over the top of that eventually, but... Oh, down there. Let's take some more of that white. Let's take some of this blue. He says, paint this painting, get seven years of good luck. Interesting. I, wonder, I, I guess I haven't... Uh... <laughs> you guys are so funny in the chat. That is hilarious. Pascal says, paint a, a painting tonight and send a picture of it and this challenge to 10 people. <sighs> I'm just gonna take this paint that I've got on here and just gonna go back over some of the other areas it's still a lot of wet paint but it sort of allows me just to mix a bit of that in real time on here Okay, slowly getting there. do the horse. Let's get some orange on here. 
and where should I do this? Right here, I think. So I'm going to take my warm yellow. Talking about still working on the apple tree painting. When did we do that? A couple weeks ago? Let's do this sword. This, the roof of that house in the corner with the same orange. And I'll let that start to dry and then I'll paint that red later on. And I'm also just going to paint this little bottle down here. to be again a little bit of a gray you know I'm gonna I kind of like this just gross color for underneath here
any other gross colors just need to be <laughs> painted in here as placeholders. Knife, hand... I think that's okay. So that's that's great for for this stage here. I'm I'm happy with my progress. <laughs> so I think let's I'm going to blow dry a little bit of this. I got a lot of wet paint. I want to start moving. You know what? Actually, I think let's go to this here. So now that I've got, you know, colors just very loosely blocked into the background and even a little bit in the foreground, I want to just now do the color on the Cossack himself in the center really that's the last part that hasn't been touched yet and then we'll blow dry it and then we'll kind of go back in and start cleaning up the background okay so uh let's mix the skin tone is very orangey peachy color so maybe let's do that to get started um We've already got this orange that we mixed up before using warm yellow and warm red. We can just add a little bit of blue to it and some white and we're gonna get pretty close in. The only thing I'm thinking about before I do that, maybe I should do his um, vest first because if I add white to this, I'm, I'll have to remix it elsewhere. So let's actually add Make a orange right here first. Little pinch of sand. Now this orange isn't quite as luminous and bright as I would like it to be. So I'm probably gonna do it a little bit, I'm just gonna paint with it. And then as after it's dry, I'll, I'll use one that doesn't have any sand in it and to kind of paint over some of this to give it a little bit of a brighter look, more intense color later. that big area that's funny <laughs> so let's now take some white and mix this in here to get uh, a lighter value and let's take a bit of my warm blue that gets us closer to a flesh tone. Okay. So I'm going to paint this on here. I'm going to lose the details of the face. Just heads up. If you really... Yeah, I'm just going uh, to, it would be pr using a technique like this with the sand, in fact I'm going to put a little more sand in here, 
it's pretty hard. Like we could do some underpainting to try to preserve that, but it would just be a real difficult, uh, you know, if we were painting on a much larger canvas, certainly. But when we're working kind of at this scale, I think it would just be more of a pain than it would be helpful. this blue that I didn't I forgot to put Okay, now what I want to do, I want to mix a purple and a black. So I need both of my reds and I need my both of yeah, and my blues, so which I'm almost out of on both sides here. Let's do the purple first. Actually, now I got a bit of red left. Cool red. So I'm going to make a purple. It's for the trousers. So I'm going to take my cool red and warm blue, mix these together. Let's see what the kind of purple we have here. It's a little bit more on the red magenta side. So that's good. The only thing is it's, it's a little bit darker and harder to see. So you know what? I'm, first of all, I'm going to take some sand and mix that in here. And then I'm going to paint with it. And then I'm going to mix a little bit of white and then go back into this in a moment.
I got some of this. Uh, no, I'm going to leave. <laughs> Let's just take a little bit of white. bit of nuance into a few places I feel like it could use a bit more color Let's do a black. Let's see. So to get a black, I'm going to take my warm red, cool blue, and a bit of cool yellow, mix those together. So cool. Cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red. Because warm red and cool blue are almost opposite from one another on the cool on the color wheel. So get this nice dark brown. In fact, let's just mix it all up in here. So we mix these two together and we're gonna get a very, very dark color. But it's got a very purpley eggplant color. Nothing wrong with that, but if we want it to be a black, we need to pull it right into the neutral core with that uh, cool yellow. Might have put a bit too much red in here, so I'll need a bit more cool blue. Because if it looks still a little bit brown, that means We've got, um, we don't have enough blue. Let's see, that should do the trick. Here we go. Now we got a nice dark color. I could put even a little bit more blue in there, but I think this is good enough. We'll take a pinch, a little bit more sand. Detail in here. I 
And then maybe I'm just going to take this dark color to see if there's... I'll just quickly... Actually, no, it's still pretty wet, so... be everything I can get away with at this moment. Okay, so now at this stage, I'm going to blow dry everything, which is going to make everything, you know, it's, it, I could probably blow dry for 20 minutes and things aren't going to dry, but not dry completely, but that will help calm down the, the the major wet areas after which I can then start getting into more of the details without it being so difficult so I'm going to mute my audio for a Okay, so everything's not dry. There's still, like, especially some of the things I just finished painting, like the legs and the boots of the Cossack, that is still quite wet. But a lot of, especially some of the background areas, they're, it, at least the top surface is starting to kind of um, dry over, which is great because that's going to allow me to start to refine things a little bit. So now I can kind of... Actually, let's do this. Okay, so now we've got our background and our foreground, or the first passes established. What I want to do now is start, I really want to finish the background. Any other little details in the background that need to be finished, I want to complete that so that I can then focus on the foreground, like doing details like the eyes and nose, all that kind of stuff on the figure. Okay, so looking at the image here, maybe we'll do side by side. What I'm, I wanna do is, is kind of right up in here, clean this up. It's got a lot of texture on this painting. That is pretty wild. Oh, 
I forgot this little knife here. Let's just do that. Do a little bit more green on top of there. See that area of the sky is still really blue. Mixing into that color in a way I'm not too happy with. In fact, I do want to do some lines over here. So I'm going to take a small brush this time. I'm going to go directly into my my warm blue here. And just want to try to like add a little bit of line work. So here's a kind of, you can see a bit of like a cubist kind of thing going on here. Uh, in that he's sort of dividing these into different planes, these little blocks. Um, so it's not entirely different than some of the other more cubist works that he did. We can see a little bit of that influence even in a painting like this. Probably going to darken that horse with some actual black eventually, but uh, I'm just going to put that in here. And I'm also going to take this blue, just do a little bit of maybe slightly outlining. Take my dark color.
clean up this whole spear. In that tree, I might kind of leave it like that. Just very delicately kind of outlining a few things here. And if I go too far, that's okay because I can always go back and kind of lighten things up. I'll probably will do in a few little places. I want to make sure that that connects, right?
So don't be afraid to make these outlines a little bit bigger because we might paint back in and almost totally obscure them, but they'll stay there and just little ghosts of them will appear. Zoom back out so we can see a bit more of the larger picture. Something fun about paint, like just the, I don't know if you can hear the grittiness of that paint as my paintbrush glides over the surface. It is, you know, very, it's pretty difficult kind of surface to paint over. But you know, we don't do this kind of thing very often, so it's kind of a nice little, um, a change of pace. Now, uh, you know what? Yeah, let's, I'm gonna go in, let's do the face. Oops. And then, so I'm gonna paint again with this, with my dark paint, and then I can always reduce some of this later on. Okay, so I get that chin in. Because I think I'm going to add a little bit of kind of orangey stuff on top of this. Let's think about where, you know, the, the middle of this face is. I'm going to put my eyes roughly here.
this mustache. Oops, I'm stamping paint all over the jacket. That's okay. I'm also going to do the hands. Now maybe I'm going to kind of use my outline to kind of help, right? So I'm just going to slide that, oops, let's see. Like what I, I'll, I do sometimes, just slide that under like that. I'll probably move it back up so it's, actually maybe I'll keep it like that. Um. You know what, I was gonna paint with this total black, but that might be a little bit intense. So instead I'm gonna go over to the flesh color that I made earlier. Maybe not make it quite so black. And then I just mix that on here and So I might need to paint another finger in there here. So I'm going to also just expand that hand. And you'll see what I mean here in a moment. Because I, I'm not happy with, with the way that looked. So... Take some red. I'm just going to add a little bit of my previous color, my flesh tone to it, so that I can get. Hmm, that was going to be for the mouth, but it got paint mixed into it. So let's just zoom right in. <laughs> Part of the paint just painting just sort of flake right off. Paint that ear. Wait for that to dry. It's uh, 
<laughs> a challenge painting with this particular with sand all over everything but Take some actual, just pure red. Put that there for those lips. Likewise, I'm going to take just a bit of cool red, magenta, and put it on that ear. Take just a bit of pure white. I think I want to do this roof of this house. Let's see if any of that paint is dry. Good enough. Let's take a bit of this warm red. Just right out of the tube onto the horse here. Let's do the um how much we call it the spear again. Mm, it's not quite as vibrant as I wanted because there was some other paint there. That's okay.
I'm just going to add a little bit of white. wasn't able to the app crashed and I wasn't able to zoom back out there for a bit <laughs> people talking about their pandemic babies their animals keeping them company <laughs> that's great I haven't heard of pandemic babies before that's great uh, you know what? I think I'm going to blow dry this because then things are still pretty wet and it's a little bit... Because what's happening is some of the paint is getting kind of caught in between some of the sand and it's uh, keeping that moisture in. And this sand was also wet when I took it out of the sandbox. So there's a lot of moisture trapped in here. Moisture. A moisture word. Um, it's a little tricky to get at here. something isn't there Thank you. 
Okay, so, um, I don't know, I think, I think I'm already here to do some finishing touches on this painting. Now there's, again, I could continue working for quite a while on here, but uh, there's the texture sort of is going to prevent me from getting too much detail, which can be frustrating or it can be liberating if you think of it that way. It's like, I know some people are like, ah, oh, it's too gritty. I can't get into the details. This is very frustrating. I totally get that. But it's also an opportunity to be like, ah, well, you know what? If I can't get it, then I can be a little bit more loose. I can just let go a little bit which is what I would encourage you to try to do as much as possible. Because that's so liberating when you just feel like, well, I guess I'm just gonna have to embrace what's here. So, um, what should we do next? No, not too far off. I think I wanna do a little bit more green. I wanna see if I can get Maybe just a little bit of this um, uh, cool yellow and cool blue, whatever is a little bit left here. I just want to add a little bit more up into here. Now that this is a little bit more electric. In fact, that might be a bit too much. some white and the warm blue.
So I feel like it's, I'm kind of, um, just kind of brushing a bunch of different colors into different little places into here to break up some of those larger shapes. So it just sort of gives it kind of nice little bit more complex textures and things around here. that tree looks very different but uh, it's just the way that it feels like it needs to be for in my painting I don't know about yours
Okay. Let's put a bit of the details on the boot. I feel like those highlights are good. Any more white in those areas? I don't think so. I want to put a bit of red. go into the face again, maybe do a little bit of a brighter area, just hmm, it's a little bit too bright, but go back into my darkest color and get this little knife.
gonna try to get that darker flesh tone for just cleaning up these fingers a little bit. That is tricky painting on such a textured surface, but it's hard to get that. Kind of going back and forth between my flesh tone and the dark value. I think I might have to blow dry that. Um, okay, I think. do is just a bit of orange and it might be pretty close to being done. Let's just take some warm yellow, a little bit of red.
dive back into the So one thing I, I'm kind of doing is just sort of blobbing some colors on because it's a little bit, th the paint is so thick that there's areas underneath that are still quite wet. little bit more tidying up and then I think we'll be done. <laughs> totally in a different part of the painting here, Michael. <sighs> oh, I just noticed that Lolly donated some money through the super chat. Thank you so much, Lolly. I appreciate that. It's so kind of you. Thanks for supporting the channel. Awesome. Well, he says, I love the painting today, Michael. Great work. Great job. Thank you for all your amazing work. I appreciate that. That's so sweet. Um, this is definitely, you know, again, it, it, it might seem pretty difficult, but I think it's just, it just takes some time to do it. It's not I don't think a particularly advanced painting. It's just you know, it requires a little bit of patience to paint over top of. Um, uh, all of the sand. <laughs> I don't know what's in his hand here. It looks like an ice cream cone that is like flowing over or something, but that's what's kind of interesting is sometimes like with paintings, trying to understand exactly what the artist 
was saying or trying to do is is impossible like it's lost to time or sometimes they didn't want us to know exactly what was going on they wanted us to to be here a hundred years later looking at it trying to being like what on earth was that all about Okay, I want to see if I can get some yellow back on that guitar. Or mandolin, probably more likely. In, like oddly enough when the one might think I find it's actually getting harder to paint as the paint is drying uh, but when it was a little bit more wet I think it felt a little bit easier to work with because I could literally sort of push the sandy paint around now that it's kind of dry I feel like it's in some ways it's easier because I don't have to I'm not um, sometimes pushing globs of paint around, but it's, it's a weird feeling of like, it's, um, the canvas sort of resisting a little bit of some of these brush strokes. I don't know how to... Describe that. One thing I am looking forward to is showing this to our daughter um, because she really likes touching the paintings that have a lot of texture on it. Not surprising, but uh, it is really kind of neat to see a little kid interacting with painting that has kind of a lot of texture, just seeing how like, they're like, oh, that's weird. Like, how does this work? And um, I should look at the original before I start doing something like that. Uh, it's not quite dark like that at all. I just don't want to put... I guess I could have to... I was like, ah, I don't want to have to use more warm blue or cool blue.
forgetting I'm not on camera. <laughs> but I think... Oh, yes. The words on the bottom. Let's see if we can do that. Like, look how gritty that is. It's almost like massaging paint. Like when you're trying to do this, this really high textured painting, you're just sort of gliding the paintbrush back and forth over this surface. Until some of that pigment sticks. grains lots of grains of sand in this paint which makes it difficult like in the paint that I'm actually using to paint this black paint which definitely makes things a little bit even more tricky to do his signature here. Yeah, let's see if we can squeeze it in. Okay. 
let's get a bit of this orange mixed up again probably a little more red in there if possible You know, as I do that, I look at his you know, closely zoomed in. I think when I add a bit more red, still going to keep some of this yellow, but I'm going to put a bit more red onto his vest here. In fact, put this brush red mostly. Horse, I think I need to take just another little look at.
Okay. So I think I'm, I'm pretty much done. But the one thing I want to just do, because I've got... I've added extra things here, is I want to see if it's feel like how balanced this painting actually is. A lot of this stuff on the sides is, is stuff that I've added. So the question in my mind is, do I want to add... We've got a lot of yellow here. Do I want to put some yellow onto the opposite side to balance it? Something. Like, what if we just put a few little... Should I outline that? Added a little bit of yellow into it. Big, so then I gotta trim it down. little dot, I think. Still April. This was nineteen. Is it nineteen oh nineteen twelve? I thought it was nineteen oh nine, but maybe it's nineteen twelve. 
Oh, wow. That is cool, because we have not done a painting like this before. That is awesome. Okay, so... It's that time where we're going to take a look at these two paintings side by side. It took a longer than I was expecting, um, just because I kind of really got into it, <laughs> which is not surprising. That's a good thing. If you just can't stop painting, uh, I think that's a good thing. So we'll look at them side by side. There's the original and... So, it is now, um, now that I look at it again, much brighter here, this bright, cool yellow. He's got much more of a mustardy, or not even mustard, it's almost like a gray yellow, where mine is bright, bright. Hmm, I don't mind that, though. It is, you know, there's going to be differences in every one of these paintings. Um... Just gonna have to touch up that boot. Uh, yeah, it's definitely it's it's strange. I mean, but it, his whole practice was strange. I guess his. His hair actually kind of goes in front of his body now that I see that. Let's just do that a little bit here. I think he's... yeah, let's do... Yeah, I can walk away from that feeling not bad, I think. How about we'll zoom in and see how some of these details turned out. <laughs> His head certainly got wider. <laughs> That's pretty funny. He he looks a little in mine a little bit tentative and nervous whereas in the original I think he looks a little bit happier. Um Let's look over here. That feels fine. Um, there we go. Definitely much, my colors are much, much brighter there. I didn't even think about that until uh, right now, but I'm just going to keep it like that. I don't mind it being a little bit bright. As you know, I kind of like my bright colors. Same thing. I mean, I guess if I those are toned down a little bit, it might make the horse and everything else pop more because they'd be, they're not, they wouldn't be taking our attention. <laughs> Uh, 
And those hands, I mean, they're very obscure to begin with. So even trying, you know, it's what are they actually doing, to be honest, is the question. I tried to clarify it a little bit. I also, I guess this mandolin could be more of a teardrop shape. Mine is almost circular. His has got a little bit more of that teardrop, but I, again, I think, <laughs> I think that's good. I think that's good. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to look at all of the comments. I was just so absorbed into painting, um, but I don't see anybody hollering at me because the sound stopped working or anything so that's usually a good sign there's nothing catastrophic um again if you're if you enjoyed today's episode you found it useful please consider subscribing hit the notification bell and if you want to leave a donation there's paypal links and other ways that you can donate to the program as well thank you for your support uh, again, you can also strongly consider making a donation to the Red Cross, to the Doctors Without Borders, uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation, uh, the uh, UNICEF, which is helping all of those organizations helping uh, refugee uh, refugees trying to escape the war in Ukraine at this very moment. I'm hoping a few years from now, if you're watching this video, you're like, what on earth are they talking about? War in Ukraine? Yeah, that's kind of the big thing everyone's talking about right at this moment. And so hopefully it's a thing in the past in your future. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys on Thursday. We're going to be taking a look at probably the greatest artist in the history of Ukraine, Taras uh, Shevchenko. The, the the all of the he was not only a great great painter but a great writer and poet uh, considered like the Shakespeare of Ukraine and so not only did he he write plays and poems just like Shakespeare but he also was a great incredible painter uh, didn't do that many which is just incredible that you could do s such great work and then just give it up and, <laughs> and do something else but uh, yeah anyway we'll 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 talk about him um, on Thursday. So thanks everyone. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll talk to you all very, very, very soon. Enjoy your night wherever you are on a beautiful planet. Peace everybody. <laughs>